to do something a little different tonight, and it won't be so much different for some of us. But if you'd like to turn to your Bibles in the book of Matthew, I'd like to keep this a little more on the line of a Bible study tonight, I guess, although I get excited in Bible study. Turn to the 23rd chapter of Matthew. A scripture that's very, very familiar to all of us. I was thinking about this today in the fellowship hall. We begin to talk some on the lines of this first part of it in the 25th verse. It says, Woe be unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the other side of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of bribery and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first the inside of the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. The scribes and Pharisees, we find that the Jesus, he was tough on them. He was tough on them. And I've made mention before when we've talked about these scriptures that, that whenever it comes to this vessel of God, I'd rather see the inside clean than the outside. I'd liken it kind of like going to a restaurant and, and I enjoy getting a, a cup of coffee at a restaurant, especially after my meal. To me, to be able to drink tea during my meal and then when I get finished, for them to come around and ask me if I'd like a cup of coffee. I mean, that is heaven when it comes to a restaurant. Because I'd rather have the tea to, to drink with my meal, but whenever it comes to the end, though, there ain't nothing like topping it off with a cup of coffee. But there's absolutely nothing that gets any better than a cup of coffee that whenever you get down to the bottom of it and find out that the cup wasn't clean. That's when I go to thinking, I'd rather see something on the outside, some smudges on the outside. But as long as I get to the bottom of my cup of coffee and find that the inside is clean, I want you to know that I am very, very satisfied. And I found over time that when you begin to wash the inside of a cup or the inside of a plate, that in the process of cleaning the inside, the outside will come clean in this process. If it's not spotless, at least it's clean enough. But please, give me the inside clean. If you can't have both clean, give me the inside clean. And, and here we find that the scribes were real good about cleaning on the outside of the cup and the outside of the plate because that's all that anybody else could see was the outside. And Jesus in verse 29 says, Woe be unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Hypocrites. I like to see somebody that, that's real on the inside. That's the foremost thing that I like to see is something on the inside that is growing within them where they have the love of God on the inside. A lot of times when we've preached on these scriptures, though, about cleanliness on the inside and the outside, I've said in too many services where they just threw the inside part out the window and just let's just worry about the outside. But as we go on down a little bit further, I want you to know the real story begins to unfold. Those hypocrites, those that... that took and, and would take and go in and out on the street corner and say their prayers so that people could hear them and look upon them and say, oh my, aren't they holy? Those that would take and begin to look at each word in the law so that they could justify the things that they wanted to do. And they had brought themselves to the place we know that when Joseph was thrown into the well, the intent was to leave Joseph in the well and let him die. 
And they had brought the, the law to the place where the law said, Thou shalt not kill. But hey, if we leave him in the well and walk away and he starves to death and dies of not having nothing to drink, that's not none of our problem. They could justify things by turning and twisting things just enough to make them feel comfortable about it. And I want you to know that today we oftentimes find that people are able to take and twist things just enough to make them feel comfortable about it. Especially when it comes to attitudes. But verse 30 said that they said and say if we had been in the days of our fathers we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. And things begin to take a, a turn here. Verse 31. So then ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them that murdered the prophets. Verse 32. Fulfill ye also the measure of your fathers. O serpent and generation of vipers, how should ye escape the damnation of hell? And as we stop there on that word hell, I'd like to say tonight that I found over the years that there's not necessarily been the most wonderful job of translating done in our Bibles. That word hell that we know today and as soon as we mention the word hell, we begin to think of flames, burning torment, a scary place. But that word hell is taken from three Greek words. One of them is Guiana. Guiana was a place outside of the city that was a dump where they took their refuge and burned it and destroyed it. It was gone. Guiana, if you go back and, and look at it, has quite a history because this is the same place that the children of Israel took their children and began to sacrifice them to false gods. They would take and throw their children into this burning fire that never went out and sacrifice their children to false gods to the beat of beating drums so they couldn't hear their children as they fell and began to burn alive in this place called Guiana. The other place is called Hades. The Greek word that hell is translated from is Hades. And that is simply the grave. When Jesus died and went down into hell to set the captives free, this hell was not a burning hell, but it was the grave. Those that were captive in the grave, those that were in Abraham's bosom, he set them free. And these were the ones that rose with him when he arose from the grave. In the last chap next to the last chapter of Matthew, it records many of the saints arose with him. Might I add tonight that this is the Resurrection. That whenever Jesus' friend Lazarus died, he met Mary and Martha and said, Lazarus will live again. And their reply was, yes, Lord. On the last day, he will rise again. That last day that he was pointing to was the resurrection of Jesus Christ when many of the saints arose after his resurrection and went into the city and began to witness of the wonderful works of God. 